three into the seven. Oh, here we go. Good morning, and welcome to Tapestry Monday Park. My name is Tim. I'm one of the elders here, and I'd love to give you some announcements this morning. But uh, before we do that, welcome to those that are joining us online um, and everyone that's here in person as well. Well, it is an exciting day for sports fans in Vancouver because the Vancouver Canucks are in the playoffs. And game one is tonight, 7 o'clock, mark your calendars. For those of you that don't know who the Canucks are and don't follow sports, well, they're the team that we cheer for every year and disappoint us every year because they've never won the championship. But this could be the year, right? This could be the year. Sometimes as a Christian Canucks fan, I think, what's going to happen first? The Canucks winning the Stanley Cup or Jesus coming back? <laughs> hard to tell. <laughs> um, if you're new, new here, there's some tap-in cards that are in front of your seats if you'd like to meet with one of our pastors or you have a prayer request or you'd like to join our mailing list. You can just fill that out and put that into the um, offering boxes in the back. And speaking of offering, if you'd like to give, um, you can give through our app. There's a tapestry app that you can give through credit card or by check or cash, and there's boxes in the, in the back that you can give to. Thanks to everyone that's been supporting um, the work of this church. We have some classes coming up, uh, discipleship classes that Sam is leading. And so first, there's a membership class. If you'd like to find out what does it mean to be a member of this church, uh, Sam's running some classes. And he's also doing a profession of faith class as well. And so all of these are Tuesday evenings, and there's an option to join on Zoom as well. So just RSVP to Sam, or if you have any questions, let him know. We've got an exciting Saturday coming up next Saturday. I'm going to call it Super Saturday. We've got a triple header because we have three events going on at the Tapestry in the morning at 10 a.m., we start with a tap ladies event. And so this is, uh, you, you'll, get a hear, you, you'll get to hear stories from Yolan and Jillian. And there's also going to be mimosas and snacks. And Yolan's also going to be displaying some of her artwork as well. And so you can RSVP to that. And then at 6 p.m., we've got a tap men's event. We're going bowling five pin bowling, I think, right, at Poco Bowl. So um, if uh, you'd like to show off your bowling skills, or you know what, if you're not very good at bowling, I think there's gutters that you can put up so that, you know, they'll just bounce back and forth and hit something. But that's at 6 p.m. And then at 7 p.m., we have a worship event in partnership with Glorify Worship Collective. And so that's going to be an evening of worship and prayer led by our friends David and Helen Chung, Dale Min and Jason Emu, who have led worship here in the past at our church. Um, I'm going to invite Rachel to come up to share about the next event. Good morning. It's a beautiful time of year. All the cherry blossoms are out. Um, I was able to... Uh, picked these this morning, my garden and my neighbor's garden. He doesn't know, but I did get permission once. Um, <laughs> as part of our Canva 2020 uh, series, where we have all these beautiful art pieces installed, and if you haven't noticed, this new um, communion table um, pieces, these are all part of um, Canva 2020. And as another addition for community connection in this series, um, I'll be offering a workshop on Saturday, May 4th. And what we'll be doing is um, looking at creation. One of my favorite pastimes um, activities is to see what is growing in nature and to create art with it. So this is a photo of mine um, using daffodils from a couple weeks ago. And um, what I love to do is, is appreciate what God has created, put it into some sort of composition, and take pictures. So I'll be very delighted to share a bit of my process with you and invite you to join me in making your own creation and taking it home, um, maybe taking some photos as well. So um, whether you find yourself artistic or not, um, we can all appreciate beauty in nature. So come and uh, join me for some time appreciating God's creation and um, playing with flowers. Thanks. 
Thank you, Rachel. Uh, last thing to mention before our call to worship is that we do have a team that prays for people after the service. And so if you have some prayer requests and you'd like some people to pray for you, uh, you can find them here at the piano after the service, and then you can just uh, speak with them and they'll pray for you. So I'm going to invite the worship team to come up, and I'll invite you to stand and join me for the call to worship, which is from Psalm 86 today. So I'll read this first slide, and you guys can read the second one that's marked all. Hear me, Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. Guard my life, for I am faithful to you. Save your servant who trusts in you. You are my God. Have mercy on me, Lord, for I call to you all day long. Bring joy to your servant, Lord, for I put my trust in you. Among the gods, there is none like you, Lord. No deeds can compare with yours. All the nations you have made will come and worship before you, Lord. They will bring glory to your name. For you are great and do marvelous deeds. You alone are God.
hands and side. Those wounds yet visible above, in beauty glorified. No angels in the sky can fully bear that sight, but downward pan their burning love and mystery soars. Crown in the Lord of life, O triumph o'er the grave, and those victorious in the strife. Grace and peace to you from God, our Father, and Christ Jesus, our Lord. Thank you, Michael and team, for leading us in those beautiful hymns. One of my favorites. We gather in the name of Jesus. It is a good name. He is a magnetic center of our community as we greet one another because maybe some of you are new to each other. Why don't you say, hi, my name is... And let's greet each other, welcome each other in this place. It's good to gather. Introduce yourself if you can haven't yet done so. <laughs> My name is Sam. <laughs> Hi. Hi, Sophia. This pump? I'd like to invite the children to join me up front. I'm on the, like, at the edge. Should I move this way? Or you guys can move closer? There we go. So many, right? This is awesome. Good morning. What? I have a question for you. Put on your thinking caps. Do you know what the name of our church is? Tapestry Monday Park. Nice. Tapestry Monday Park. Okay, this might be a harder question. What is a tapestry? Kayla? Right, yep, something you weave. And it's usually made with threads, threads woven together. Good. 
So some of you didn't know that, so now you know. It's like art made with threads woven together, except for the tapestry that I made and brought today. I made it out of strips of paper weaved together. I'm going to show it to you. I'm so glad I made this. You see your name? Well, now do you know this is made with strips of paper that I wove through the back, the background that's blue. So this is a paper tapestry, but do you know why are all your names on my tapestry? Do you know? Brian? The notebook? Mm -hmm. Because you are what? Right, you are all part of Tapestry Monday Park. Each and every one of you is part of this church. Now, look around you. Look at your friends. You can look out at all the adults and your parents. Do they look all the same? No. And they probably don't act all the same, do they? That's because every one of us is different or unique but here's the deal. We all belong here. Now, I don't know if you ever read the sign that's out front of our church. Do you know what it says? It says, yeah, Tapestry Monday Park. Underneath that, it says a community woven in faith. Good, Kayla. That's awesome. So what that means is because of our faith in Jesus that we are woven together as a church family. Now, what if somebody new comes to our church, shows up for tap kids? Can they be woven into our tapestry? Yes, they can. There's there's some extra space and we could make and we could make another one, couldn't we? And if this if we had one that was big as the whole church family, it would be really really big. This is just the tap kids. Imagine how big my tapestry would be if we included everybody else in the tapestry. Well, the grades, uh, or kindergarten to grade five today, we are going to talk about the early church and our stories from the book of Acts. So I'm going to tell you a few things about that church family. They met together often. They loved each other so very much. They ate together, and they prayed together, and they uh, had the Lord's Supper together, and they worshiped together. Does that sound like any of the things that we do here at Tapestry? Yeah? Do we do any of those things? Do we eat together? Yep, we eat lots of good food together. Do we pray together? Yes. Do we worship or sing together? Yes. So in many ways, this church is just like the early church. So I just want you to know that you are all very important and woven into this community of faith. And you matter. And I'm so glad that you're here today. Let's pray together. Dear Lord, thank you so much for each child who is here, who is woven into our community of faith, and for all the adults as well. God, thank you for bringing us together because of our faith in you. Help us to grow in you and to care for each other. And be with us as we go into our classes. Help us to learn about you and draw closer to you. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, so... Oh, everybody knows where to go. Kindergarten to grade five, that way. Nursery and preschool, out those doors and downstairs.
let's stand together if you can. Um, we're going to sing a version of Psalm 23. Many of you are familiar with uh, In Christ Alone by Stuart Townend. And he wrote this piece as well, for some reason not as known maybe in Canada, very known in England. So we're going to do it. And we're going to teach the chorus off the top. And, and the women, if you follow Francis, that's your part uh, in the bracket. And then we'll have uh, a kind of a call and response there between the men and the women. And I will trust in you alone. And I will trust in you alone. For your endless mercy follows me. Your goodness will lead me. Home. You'll get lots more tries. Here we go. The Lord's my shepherd. me lie in pastures green. He leads me by the still, still waters. His goodness restores my soul. And I will trust. And I will trust in you alone. And I will trust. my ways in righteousness, and he anoints my head with oil, and my cup it overflows with joy. I feast on his pure delight, and I will trust in you alone. Good morning, Tapestry. Uh, my name is Mike, and I have the privilege of leading us in prayer and the reading of his word this morning. Let's approach our Heavenly Father together in prayer. Almighty God, creator of all, omnipotent one, and yet our Father, who loves us dearly as his sons and daughters, Lord, we lift your name high in our hearts and in our songs of praise this morning. You are a God who makes and keeps wonderful and amazing promises to us, your people. 
Father, we come before you as our creator and our judge. And we are also conscious that daily we reject you in our hearts, minds, and actions. We confess that though you are the most glorious, beautiful, awesome thing in our universe, our hearts are often cold to you and we put a low priority on our relationship with you, our maker. Just as we commemorate your son's total obedience, including death on a Roman cross, we confess that at the smallest inconvenience or denial of pleasure, we often quickly turn away from doing what pleases you. Please forgive us and change us that we might res be responsive to your word. Cleanse our hearts and minds and send your Holy Spirit to dwell within us so that our lives may be lived as you would have it, boldly and for you alone. Thank you that we can breathe in the resurrection life and that we are fully redeemed and restored. As you have so freely forgiven us, help us not to hold on to this gift, but extend your forgiveness and love to all of our neighbors. Lord, we bring our petitions to you this morning for peace in our fallen world. Our hearts and minds are troubled by the increasing conflicts in the Middle East and Ukraine. We acknowledge that without your presence, no human leadership will be able to bring about peace. Please provide wisdom and compassion to leaders who are in a position to influence outcomes. Bless the organizations that bring relief to those displaced or impacted. Lord, closer to home, we think of those amongst us, friends, colleagues, neighbors, relatives who are struggling with sickness, disease, mental health, or other issues, whether publicly or in private. Let us pause to bring our individual petitions to you, the almighty healer and Lord of all. Our Father, the all-powerful healer, we pray for your hand upon them. Lord, despite all that is happening in this world, in our local communities, in our individual lives, we need to acknowledge that the earth and its people are in your hands. We praise you and thank you that you embrace a fallen world. Help our souls to rest in that certainty. We pray all these things in your son's most holy name. Amen. Our scripture passage this morning comes from Romans 12, verses 1 to 2. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. This is the word of the Lord. Mike for leading us in prayer and reading that scripture for us. If we haven't met already, my name is Sam, the campus pastor here. We're going to continue our sermon series in the book of Romans, diving into chapter 12, those first two verses. I have a question for you, though, just to kind of get things started. Three questions. First one, who has inspired you the most? Who has inspired you the most? Another question. Who would you say has shown you a life well lived? Think of maybe a person that comes to mind. Who has influenced you in your discipleship to Jesus the most? Maybe there's a person that comes to mind. 
My parents have been a huge influence in my journey of faith. They've encouraged me to pursue seminary when I sensed the pangs of an internal call to ministry. My mom was there to pray with me, counsel me in times of struggle and doubt. My dad actually went to seminary the same year that I was. His last year at Regent College was my first year, and we had lots of great conversations around the table about faith and theology, about church. I remember him sitting with me as we worked through, or as I worked through, Martin Buber's great book, I and Thou. If any of you who know that book, it's a pretty dense piece of work. My parents have been a huge influence in my faith journey, and I wouldn't be here if it wasn't in part to their wisdom, their counsel, their prayers, their example that they set for me as a follower of Jesus. But beyond my parents, there have been some other people who have inspired me and have shown me a compelling vision of what it means to be Christian. People like St. Augustine, one of my patron saints, I love quoting him, and certainly the most famous of his quotes, where he writes in his book, Confessions, you have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they find rest in you. He's a patron and saint of mine. His story speaks to me. His theology inspires me. He teaches, his teaching, you know, cultivates a love for God that's to eclipse all other loves and make God my greatest pursuit. Augustine, a huge influence on me. And so is Diedrich Bonhoeffer, the Lutheran pastor theologian who decided not to stay in the safety of his American life, but returned to Germany while the Nazis were in power. His books, his writings, his teaching, speaking against the power of his day, all of it so inspiring. He called a generation of Christians to count the cost of true discipleship, and that call continues to challenge generations of people to this day. Bonhoeffer patron saint of mine. And so is Martin Luther King Jr., the Southern Baptist pastor, preacher, activist, social justice warrior, the one who led a nonviolent movement for racial equality that still speaks wisdom to us today. I love how Dr. King's faith moved beyond his pulpit on Jackson Street and led him to march up and down almost every main street in protest. His gospel was personal. Yes, it was call for personal transformation, but it was also social, also seeking to bring social change for the love and glory of God. Dr. King, a hero of mine. And so also, St. Teresa of Calcutta, She was known for caring for the least of the least of these, loving orphans, healing the sick. She gave herself to Christ first and saw the face of Christ in every person she met. Her acts of mercy coming out of a heart full of mercy that was formed by a God of mercy, St. Teresa of Calcutta, an inspiration to me. And what about you? Who might be your patron saints? The people in your life who have inspired you, have taught you the way of Jesus, who has influenced the way you think, the way you believe, the way you behave. Maybe it might be a person in history, a saint from the past whose living faith inspires you, speaks to you, encourages you. Or maybe it's a person closer to home, like a friend, a parent, an uncle, aunt, grandmother, grandfather, teacher, pastor, colleague, a person in your life who's helped you in your journey towards Christ. We all have people in our lives like this because the truth is there is no discipleship to Jesus without people showing us the way, showing us a compelling vision of what the Christian life means And what a life well-lived looks like. It takes people showing us the way. I asked you those questions at the beginning 
thinking about a few people that come to your mind. And I have a prompt here, a question to remind us. Take a few moments just to reflect on that question. Who do you admire as a model of Christian faith? And who has influenced your life and faith the most? Think about that. And I'm going to ask you, if you're able and willing, turn to the person next to you and share who that person might be. And if nobody comes to mind, that's okay. Sit quietly, peacefully, wait till we get through this part, the uncomfortable part, and then we'll get into it. So yeah, why don't you share with each other? Who has influenced your faith and life the most? All right, I'm going to interrupt. <laughs> I'm glad to hear all the murmuring and the conversation. What makes these people such an inspiration and influence to us, I ask myself. I think it's because they live out their faith in Jesus with courage and with deep conviction. They offer their lives as a living witness to the grace and mercy of God. Of course, these people that we think of and those people that I have mentioned, these people are not perfect. No one is. But what makes their lives so compelling is that they've embodied the gospel that they believe. They live it out faithfully as best as they know how. And they give their lives over to a cause that is greater than the sum total of their own happiness. What makes them so inspiring, I think, is because they live out their faith with integrity. What they believe and how they live matches up. It lines up. You see, this is such an important point to make because Christianity is not just a set of doctrines or beliefs or a philosophical school of thought or even a set of principles that govern the universe, though the Christian faith, of course, is all of those things. But rather, the Christian faith, Christianity, is a life that is lived well, a life that is lived for the glory of God. It's a life that comes alive because of the grace of God that is at work in the lives of fallen and sinful human beings like you and me. It's a life nestled in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus and embodies that good news to the world and to all who would see and hear. You see, Christianity is more than a set of doctrines. It's a life lived that becomes a sweet fragrance for those who come near it. Yes, of course, Christianity is about what we believe, but it's also about how we shall live. Of course, it's necessary that we have right doctrine, right teaching, a right understanding of who God is and who Jesus is and who the Holy Spirit, how to read the Bible. We need a robust theological vision of the Christian faith that we can live into that includes all of life, yes, we need orthodoxy, right beliefs. But if that doesn't produce in us orthopraxy, right practice, then we're only half of the gospel. Because how we live really, really matters. Think about how many people have rejected the Christian faith because how Christians live. Christians who say one thing but live contrary to what they believe. Christians who preach about love but fail to live a life of love. Christians who preach truth yet fail to live under that truth. I'm sure many of us know of people who have resisted the Christian faith because of the unfaithful lives of those who profess faith in Christ. And so we live with that sobering reality that sometimes we Christians become a stumbling block 
for people to come to know Jesus. And we're reminded, or I'm reminded, of the words of Mohammed Gandhi, who said to a friend, a priest friend of his, that he had befriended, I like your Christ, but I do not like your Christians. Your Christians are so unlike Christ. And so friends, friends of Jesus, what we need to hear today is this radical call for us to live compelling lives. I don't mean perfect, perfect lives, but compelling lives. Lives that reflect the one whom we love and worship, reflecting Christ Jesus, our Lord. We're talking about orthopraxy today because that's where we've come to in Paul's great letter to the church in Rome. We're continuing this sermon series in the book of Romans, and we've come to a section where Paul transitions from unpacking the depth and breadth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, this gospel that he's unashamed of preaching because it's the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. This section that we're in marks a transition where Paul transitions from describing the gospel to talking about how we live in light of the gospel. Romans 12 marks this transition in his letter where Paul shifts from talking about the gospel to teaching us how to live out the gospel in daily life. In fact, the rest of his letter from chapter 12 all the way to chapter 16 is Paul working out this gospel in the dust and dirt of our daily communal life. He teaches us how to value the diversity of members and gifts who make up the body of Christ. He shows us how we are to live a radically countercultural movement of love. He shows us how to live with our two feet firmly planted in this world while yet we eagerly await the coming of God's new radical new world. Chapters 12 and 16 is Paul's wonderful, practical way of showing us how to live as Christians. And what he says in these two verses essentially is a summary statement for all of the rest of the things that he says in chapters 12, 13, 14, 15, and 16. And so we're going to dive into the first two verses of Romans 12, and it is packed with so much good teaching. One of my favorite preachers of the 20th century is a wealth pastor by the name Martin Lloyd-Jones. And he actually preached 10 sermons on just these two verses alone, which is amazing to know that there's so much wisdom packed in these two verses. Now, we're not going to do 10 sermons on these two verses. We're only going to do one. (laughs) I highly recommend, if you do want to listen to what he has to say find him, you can find him on the internet. But we're only spending one week in this, but my hope and my prayer is that we die, as we dive into this text, that it will inspire you and me, all of us, to live lives that are a compelling witness of the goodness and grace of God. And so let's reread this text together before I draw out three lessons for us today. And I'm going to invite us to read it together. And maybe just to get our bodies moving again, I'm going to invite you to stand, if you are able, and let us read and hear and listen to these words today. Read it with me. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will know his good and perfect will. You may be seated. Now, the first thing I want to say right off the bat is that this is a word that Paul is giving to what he calls brothers and sisters. Paul is writing to those who have heard the call of Jesus to come and follow me. 
those who have heard the gospel, who have responded to it in repentance and faith. He's writing to Christians who profess Jesus as Lord, which I think is an important thing to note. Because for obvious reasons, what he is teaching here is really applying to those who are Christians. He's writing an exhortation to those who believe in Jesus. And so if you're here today and you're watching online and you don't call yourself a Christian, then that's okay. Because what is being spoken today is really not for you. We're glad that you're here today. You can listen in on what Paul is saying to those who profess in Christ. Like going to a wedding and listening to the pastor give a message to the bride and groom, so too you're invited to listen in on a message that's being spoken to Christians. And for those of us who profess Christ, let this be a reminder that what Christ calls us to is not the same as what he calls those who do not profess him as Lord. You see, too often we hold up this Bible as an ethical standard for all people at all times, calling people to obey the things in the Bible when they don't even believe in the God of the Bible. And so let these words, the words that we're hearing today, apply first to our own lives before trying to apply them to anyone else. And so in the spirit of what Paul says in verse 1, therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, meaning listen to what I have to say, take it to heart, apply it in your own lives. I urge you, call you, summon you, I beg you, I encourage you to offer your lives as living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship, and do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good and pleasing will. Now, as we dive into these two verses, there are three lessons that I want to highlight here that helps to frame the heart of all that we do and how we're called to live as Christians. And I'll give it to you up front, just so you can track with me. And the first lesson is that the Christian life is a life first and foremost motivated by love. And the second is that the Christian life is a life that is moved into active service. And the third, is that the Christian life is a life that is molded into Christ-likeness. Motivated by love, moved into active service, molded into Christ-likeness. And so first, the Christian life, primarily motivated by love. I say this because of this really small phrase in verse One, where Paul says, therefore, in view of God's mercy, dot, 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 dot. You see what he's done there? In view of God's mercy, dot, 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 dot. You see, Paul grounds all that he says about how we're to live, all of our lifestyle, all of our behaviors, all of our practices. He grounds all of it in God's mercy. He grounds it in the gospel that he unpacked from chapter 1 all the way to chapter 11 in view of God's mercy, he says. In view of this gospel revealed in Christ Jesus, this gospel that declares you and me justified before God, righteous in his sight, this gospel that tells you and me that we are chosen in him, adopted into his family, called sons and daughters of God, given the gift of the Holy Spirit who lives and dwells within us, this spirit who helps us to pray when we can't even find the words to pray on our own, helping us to pray for ourselves, praying for our broken and hurting world, praying for all of creation, groaning with eager anticipation of God's salvation to come. You see, Paul grounds all that he says about how we're to live Christian ethics 
in the gospel of Jesus Christ. In view of all that God has done in Christ for you and for the world, he says, I then urge you to live a life that brings glory to God and causes people to give thanks to God because of your life. You see, at the heartbeat of the Christian life is a life that's motivated by love. Love for God, love for neighbors, love. Because God first loved us and now calls us to love the world that he came to love when he sent his one and only beloved son into the world, not to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. This is our ultimate why, the why we do all of this. All of our ethics coming out of the primary motivation of love. See, I'm reminded of the story in Luke's gospel. You might remember the story of when Jesus is reclining at the table of a prominent Pharisee's house. And while he's there, there's a woman who had lived a sinful life, and she came up and stood behind him, and she was weeping and crying. Her tears were falling on his feet, and then she began to wipe her tears off with her hair, cleaning his feet kissing them, pouring this expensive perfume on them, and the religious leaders, they scoffed at this woman, questioned Jesus' character. And this is what Jesus said in response. Do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not even give me any water for my feet, but yet she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not pour or put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her, her many sins have been forgiven as her great love has shown. And these searing words, but whoever has been forgiven little loves little. Whoever has been forgiven little loves little. Meaning the flip side, whoever has been forgiven much loves much. The point of this story is to show us that we are all like the woman who knows just how great her sins are, but knows even more so how Gracious and compassionate Jesus is, how slow to anger he is, how abounding in love and mercy he is on all of us who have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. It's because of God's great mercy. We, like the woman, ought to fall at his feet with great love and devotion, offering all that we have in a grateful response to his mercy. The story of the woman's sacrificial love is a story how everything that we have is given in service to God out of a response to his good and gracious love towards us. In light of God's mercy, Paul says. And so friends, let love and gratitude be the primary motivation for all that you do. Love and gratitude not obligation, not for personal reward or gain, but let love and gratitude be the very motivation that moves you. Let your ethic be grounded in the love of God. For what good is it if we do all of these things but do not have love, right? What good is it if we have 2.2 kids A big house with a white picket fence, a car that everyone dreams of but do not have love. Without love, these things hang around our necks like cheap jewelry. And what good is it if we have all the smarts in the world from either books or from the streets and we do not have love? Without love, all of the brilliant ideas fall on deaf ears and get no real traction. You see, we can have tremendous athletic prowess. We can have 
an inspiring artistic vision. We can throw ourselves into a cause that's worthy of the gods, but if we do not have love, all of that accomplishment is meaningless, simply evaporating in our hands. Love must be the primary motivation for all that we do for God. Let that be what moves you. Love for God out of gratitude for what he has done. Now, the second lesson we learn about the Christian life is that this life is always moved into active service. And we see this in what Paul urges us to do. He says, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as living sacrifice, as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. You see, the image that Paul uses here comes from the sacrificial system of Israel's worship, where worshipers would come to the temple with a bull or a goat, a sheep or a dove, some small animal that would be placed on the altar as a sacrifice, a free will offering, thanking God for his blessing. But Paul turns that around, points that towards us. And he says, but instead of offering up an animal, Paul says, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, your bodies, your physical bodies, the sum total of who you are, offer your whole body, your whole self, your mind, your will, your emotions, your body, your soul, offer your whole self as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, your body. It's important to emphasize the word bodies here because for Paul, our bodies matter. And what we do with our bodies matter greatly. You see, we don't just have a body, we are a body. And we don't just have a soul, but we are souls. And that soul is deeply integrated with our bodies. In fact, it's through our bodies that we express our souls And what we do with our bodies actually impact our souls. You see, we are soulful bodies or embodied souls. We are an integrated whole. And so what Paul is saying is offer up your whole self, your whole body as a living sacrifice. And the words living sacrifice is a paradoxical image that smashes the words life and death together, literally meaning living death. And so what Paul is saying is that the Christian life is like a living death. Yeah, a death to self, a death to the claim that I have a right over my own life. It's a life that's freely and completely offered to God. It's this all-inclusive offer of all of who I am in service of God, learning to place myself in second place. This is our true and proper worship, Paul says. Worship. Worship meaning an act of service, an act of offering our gifts in service of a purpose greater than our own pleasure. It's about offering our time, our treasures, our talents, offering our very self in service of God first and foremost, offering it to God. So yes, I am serving people. Yes, I am fulfilling a responsibility. Yes, I am working for the benefit of myself and others, but in all of what I do, All of what I say, all of it is in service primarily towards God above all things. I think this is a helpful mindset shift for us. I love how Paul puts it in Colossians 3, 22 and 24. He's talking to slaves. He says, slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything and do it not only when their eye is on you, and to curry their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. For whatever you do, work 
at it with all of your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. I love that. That simple shift that my work and what I do primarily, yes, it serves other people, but in the heart of hearts, how I approach all of it is actually I give it unto the Lord. And so when you play volleyball, do it unto the Lord. When you're serving under a tirading boss, then do it unto the Lord as best as you can. And if you are playing music, Yes, do it so that people enjoy the music, but do it unto the Lord. Whatever you do, do it unto the Lord first. That's the primary shift that I think we need to make. And it really echoes the greatest commandment of all is to love God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind and strength, and to love our neighbors as ourselves. It's about orienting our lives and loves around someone or some other cause other than ourselves, and to do this over and over again, to be a living sacrifice. You see, the heartbeat of the Christian life is a life that is moved into active sacrificial service to God. And I know that might sound very heavy, because <laughs> we like to hold on to a lot in our lives, I think. I do, certainly. And so we hear these words, offer your bodies, your whole selves as a living sacrifice, your bodies. Now the third lesson we're taught here about the Christian life is that it's a life that's molded into the likeness of Christ. And we see this in what Paul says in verse 2. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed, metanoia, transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then you will be able to test and improve what God's will is, his good and pleasing and perfect will. The lesson here is to not be pressed into the mold of the world, though we live in the world, but to live in it and to live in a radical new way of life, one that is being transformed more and more into the likeness of Christ. I like how Eugene Peterson translates this verse in, his, in the message. He says this, don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize that he wants what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you, develops well-formed maturity in you. I love that rendering of those verses, being transformed, changed by the renewing of our minds. It means having our minds saturated by Scripture. It means seeing life through a new lens, reframed by the way we understand God and who he is in Jesus. It's rethinking the way we think about ourselves, work, sex, money, justice, peace, mission, eating, sleeping. It's everything under the sun, seeing through a different lens. It's having our minds renewed by the vision of God's coming kingdom. And ultimately, it means having the mind of Christ himself. I love how Paul puts it in Philippians chapter 2, when he talks about the community and how we're to love one another and keep the unity and care for one another, bearing each other's burdens and not thinking of myself first, but thinking about others. And he says, have the same mind of Christ, who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used for his own advantage. 
Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being a found, and found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. It's about having the mind of Christ who humbled himself, self-emptied his self for the sake of God and for the sake of the world and for the sake of us, you and me, to come home to God. And so friends, live a life motivated by love. Live a life that's marked by sacrificial service. I don't know what that means for your life and what that actually looks like in all of your relationships, but ask yourself the question, am I giving up anything for the sake of God? But let your life be marked by sacrificial service. And then have your life molded by Jesus. Seek to desire, want to be like him be transformed like him, want to look like him. These are the three lessons that I think we see in these passages. And for that, I'm just going to end. Let me pray. Gracious God, we thank you that you are good and gracious. Us. We thank you that you are a God who has created each of us in your image, that we are each fearfully and wonderfully made. We thank you that though we have fallen away, <laughs> gone wayward, though the, we have put ourselves first and not second, Lord, though we have wandered, you have sought us chased us, wooed us, called us to your son, Jesus. We thank you that we are called your children, adopted, given the gift of the Holy Spirit. Lord, let this life in Christ radically transform each of us who declare you as Lord, that we might live lives that become a fragrant offering to you, pleasing to this world and a blessing to others. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Well, friends, uh, as we ponder being motivated to love, living lives of sacrifice, trying to imitate Jesus, uh, we're going to do something new as we bridge from the sermon to communion. Uh, as you know, we're surrounded by all this new art. I hope you've had a chance to look at it. We were given a grant by the Calvin Institute. There's going to be, through the year, new pieces of music for the church, organically from within this church. And so we're going to do one this morning for you based on Paul's text in Colossians 1, 15 to 19, in which he says that all things hold together in Christ, including the fractures, including the things that don't make sense, including the breaches that we still may be carrying or ruptures in relationship. He proclaims all things hold together in you. Now we're going to learn the chorus. And I think gradually you'll get on the verses. So why don't we stand together, be a full voice, and see how we do. The first thing that we're going to do 
is proclaim him as king of the world. Are you ready? Jesus, king of the world, holding all things by your grace. There's your first two lines. Here we go. Jesus, king of the world, holding all things by your grace. Well done. The next line is similar to the first, and it goes, Emmanuel, God in our midst, to you all honor and praise. Let's try that. Emmanuel. Emmanuel, God in our midst, to you all honor. Now, there's a big section afterwards in which we go, Amen. And you can really bellow this one out because, as it says in the text, we say Amen to who? To the glory of God. So it goes, Amen. Amen. You're going to get three of those. Amen. And we say, all things hold together in you. Got it. Well done. You are the image, the unseen God, firstborn over all creation. For by you all things were created for good, things in heaven, things on the earth. The visible, the invisible, all authorities and powers that be. All things created by you and for you, oh mystery of your divine being. Jesus, King of the world, holding all things by your grace. Emmanuel, Emmanuel, God in our midst, to you all honor and praise. Amen. 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 All things hold together in you. Christ, the head of the body, the church, the alpha, firstborn from the dead. Life from nothing, no life from the grave, rightly called the Lord of all. by your grace, Emmanuel, O oh God, in our midst, to you all honor and praise, Amen, 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 all things hold together. Suffered in this fallen world, enduring all things for our sake. And by your blood, the cross paves the way to reconcile the universe you made. Hey! Just when I thought the world's coming apart, your kindness holds so many. Out in my heart to the risen sun, the miracle who fashions all things. Oh, Jesus, King of the world, holding all things by your grace. Emmanuel, oh God, in our midst, to you all the honor. Oh, Jesus.
first amen. Here we go. Amen. All things hold together. with you. You may be seated. We gather around this table to celebrate the good news that is amongst us, revealed in Jesus Christ. If you love Jesus and long to love him more, come and gather around this table. If you're saying yes to Jesus for the first time or the first time in a long time, if you profess him as Lord, come and gather and celebrate his love for us, for you, for this world. I'm going to invite us to pray this prayer of confession. The words are on the screen for us. Let us come before our God in humility, knowing that his kindness leads us to repentance. Let us pray. There will be a moment of pause for silence for us to pray our own prayers of confession. So let us pray these words. Almighty God, in raising Jesus from the grave, you shattered the power of sin and death. We confess that we remain captive to doubt and fear, bound by the ways that lead to death. We overlook the poor and the hungry and pass by those who mourn. We are deaf to the cries of the oppressed, indifferent to calls for peace. We despise the weak and abuse the earth you made. Forgive us, God of mercy. Help us to trust your power to change our lives and make us new, that we may know the joy of life abundant, given in Christ Jesus, the risen Lord. Friends, hear this good news. God, who is rich in mercy out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ and raised us with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places so that in the ages to come he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. The fruit of the gospel is a heart of gratitude. It's the default spirituality of the Christian life. And so would you join me in praying this prayer of thanksgiving. Words are on the screen. By the power you raised Jesus from death to life, through his victory over the grave, we are set free from the bonds of sin and the fear of death to share the glorious freedom of the children of God. In his rising to life, you promise eternal life to all who believe in him. We praise you that as we break bread in faith, we shall know the risen Christ among us. And so on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. And after he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And the same way, he took the cup and he said, this cup is the New covenant poured out in my blood. Whenever you drink of this, do this in remembrance of me. For friends, whenever we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death and his coming again. Would you join me in proclaiming the mystery of our faith? Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Dying, you destroyed our death. Rising, you restored our life. Lord Jesus, come in your glory. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, we thank you for these simple gifts of bread and cup. We ask that by your spirit, it would become the body and blood of Christ for us, nourishing us on the journey that we might be shaped more and more into your likeness as we say yes to you, thanking you for the grace that is at work in our lives sanctifying us through and through. 
And so as we gather around this table, we pray the prayer that you have taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever, amen. We'll have three stations, one to my left, center, and right. We have gluten-free alternatives at the center. If you desire that and need that, come down the center aisle. God makes peace with us through Christ, commands us, calls us to be peacemakers. Stand, if you're able, and to turn to as many people as you can and say the peace of Christ be with you as we gather around this table of peace. So friends, you can follow the traffic signs, come hungry and thirsty for Christ, the gifts of God for the people of God, let us eat with glad and sincere hearts. treasures 
Friends, for this last song of worship, let us stand together. And here's a little teaser as to who the composer was. Some say he was completely deaf on his final symphony. Some say he could still hear in his left ear. Who are we talking about? Ludwig, of course. And as we know, Ludwig did have a slightly funky side to uh, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. I think that came from Bavaria or whatever. Anyway, we're going to have a little bit of rhythm into this beautiful piece. And the lyrics are written by Bruce Robertson. For those of you who went uh, to Missions Fest down at Canada Place, any people who ever went there? All right. So Bruce always led the worship, was the MC, and a former Salvation Army man. I went to his funeral two weeks ago, and it was quite moving hearing this piece with the full Salvation Army brass. Uh, we've got enough up here to, I think, pull this off. Here we go. It's, it's the pilgrim song based on Psalm 84. So you just follow the melody, which you all know, right? Because you're all German. All right. <laughs>
That was awesome. We'll receive these words as your benediction, wherever the Lord leads you, wherever you find yourself in this coming week. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord be gracious to you. I forgot the words. Face shine upon you. You know what? I'm going to shift it up. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen.